Amen. Bow your heads. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for letting us be here today. And Lord, as we open your word, we open our heart. We pray that you would speak to us. We ask you this, Father, in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. You know, we're in, a, this, we're in a series of messages entitled The Fruit of the Spirit. That's why you're going to get fruit later on. We'll, we'll finish it off tomorrow, next week, but we wanted you to get fruit because next week we have a fundraiser. But I want to speak to you on the last uh, fruit that the Bible mentions, and it's the fruit of self-control. Uh, some of your Bible says temperance. Some of your Bible says discipline. But I want to speak to you on what that means. Let me read to you a quote that someone gave. Someone has said that the first victory that successful people ever achieve or win is the victory over themselves. Let me read it again. The first victory that successful people ever achieve or win is the victory over themselves. You know, the moment we begin to have victory over our own desires and we become self-controlled, then all of a sudden we become victorious over all the areas in our lives. I believe one of the reasons why we struggle so much in life so many times is that we lack self-control, we lack discipline. Now, we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, which we have called virtues. By the way, a virtue is a moral excellence. A virtue is a trait or a quality that is morally good and is valued, is valued as a foundation of being a good moral person. In other words, uh, a, a virtue is a behavior that shows high moral standards, doing what is right, avoiding what is wrong. You know, the opposite of virtue is vice. And Paul, when he writes to the Galatians in chapter 5, he talks about the vices as the works of the flesh. And then he talks about the virtues as the fruit of the Spirit. And we've been looking at those individually in great detail. But the virtue of self-control is probably the most important, and I'll tell you why. Because without self-control, the works of the flesh cannot be overcome. You know, the other elements of the fruit of the Spirit will not be evident if you do not have self-control and you have discipline. It's very important. I believe with all my heart that this virtue of self-control is one that many people long for, but very few people attain it. As a matter of fact, most people don't even try to practice self-control or be disciplined for the simple reason is that they don't want to say no to themselves. It's very hard to say no to yourself. And yet, as, as tough as self-control and discipline is, we know that without it, we will struggle in life. Not only will we struggle, it will create a lot of problems. You know what? For ourselves. There's a lot of things that we face today are our fault because we didn't have discipline or self-control. How many times because of, lack, of a lack of self-control, you've gone out and done things that later you regret? You know, later realizing, you know what? I should not have done that. That was a lack of self-control. That was a lack of discipline. And it has hindered me. It has hurt me. It has complicated my life. It has made things difficult for me. Because the truth of the matter is that the lack of control in our lives is sometimes seen in our emotions, in our desires, in how we talk, in our ambitions. And sometimes when we don't practice self-control and don't have it, it really affects us in a very negative way. But here's the question I want us to consider this morning. What does the Bible say about that? <clears throat> what does the Bible say about self-control? So let me give you a definition of what self-control is in the Bible. Self-control is a word that means to get a hold of or to get a grip on. Literally, when the Bible talks about self-control, it means to get your hands on something until you are in control of it. It's not in control of you. You are in control of it. The word self-control describes a person who has a grip on their life and they have control of their life. In other words, self-control is the power to keep oneself in check, keep oneself on track, keep oneself focused. Wouldn't it be great if all of us could stay on track and stay focused in what we want to accomplish? You know, in the Hebrew, the Old Testament, there is a, a word picture of self-control. And it talks a lot about self-control in the Old Testament. But over there in Proverbs, in chapter 25, in verse 28, let me read it to you. This is a word picture of self-control. Notice what it says. A man without self-control is as defenseless as a city with broken down walls. Let me read it again. A man or a woman without self-control is as defenseless as a city with broken down walls. Now, when that proverb was written, cities were safe only because they had walls. The old cities had walls around them. And what the proverb writer says is that the moment we lose self-control and self-discipline, we're a city without any kind of walls. In other words, any kind of protection. And when people, when occupants of a city neglected their walls, what they were doing is that they were neglecting themselves. They were neglecting their, their, their safety. 
by not building the walls, by not maintaining the walls. You know what? They were putting themselves in danger. And the enemy would see them as weak and as feeble. You know, likewise, when you have no self-control, the Bible says you are weak. You are foolish. You are very unwise. You know, self-control is one of those virtues that is necessary to keep us safe, to keep us in line and on focus. Now, in the Bible, there's a lot of metaphors. There's a lot of illustrations of self-control. The Bible is filled with images that will help us understand why self, uh, self-control is important in our lives, especially for spiritual growth. You know, the Bible talks about the soldier. The Bible talks about the athlete. The Bible talks about the farmer and how they practice self-control. Let me read it to you in 2 Timothy. Paul writes to a young pastor in chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. Notice what he says. He writes to Timothy and he says, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. In other words, Paul says, listen, Christians, do you realize that you are, you know, you, you have to have self-control. Like the soldier, like, like, like the athlete, like the farmer. You know, like, like the soldier, you know, we're supposed to be dedicated. Like, like the athlete, we're supposed to be disciplined. Like the farmer, we're supposed to be diligent. And it all talks about self-control. But by far, the most frequent metaphor about self-control that the Bible uses or Paul uses is uh, the metaphor of an athlete in the athletic arena. You know, I, I think I would be safe to say that Paul was a sports junkie because he writes a lot about athlete, a- athletics. You know, and, and since the Bible tells us that we're to follow his example, I, I'm a sports fan too. Don't criticize me. You know what? I love sports. As part of my spiritual duty, I believe I, I love watching the Rams. Amen. I, especially, I love watching the Rams beat up on the Chargers and the Raiders, especially. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. <laughs> but you know, Paul, Paul loved to draw teachings from the training that was required of an athlete. And here are some passages. Let me just give you a couple of ideas. You'll be amazed how much Paul talks about the athlete in the athletic arena. Over there in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, notice what it says. Paul writing, he says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He, he likened his walk with the Lord as a race. Galatians 5, 7 says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and keep you from obeying the truth? In other words, he writes to the Galatians, he goes, you know, you guys were running a good race. You've lost focus. Why? What, what has happened that has caused you to lose, lose focus in this race? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Paul writes and he says, Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of good value. Now notice, remember that when you hit the gym this week. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. In other words, the same way you work out to stay healthy, spiritually work out. But you know, a physical workout just helps you now, but spiritual workout and being disciplined and self-control not only helps you here, but will help you in eternal life. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. In other words, Paul says a good runner gets rid, uh, rid of everything that weighs him down, holds him back. And that's what we're to do. We're to run our race and we're to run it, you know what, with the purpose of not being weighed down. And then in 2 Timothy 4.7 Paul, as he ends up his ministry, he writes these words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. But notice, and there's a lot more, the athletic arena. Now, Paul, Paul himself is probably the greatest example, apart from Jesus, of what self-control looks like. He writes to the Corinthians, and he tells them what he has learned about a life with self-control, a life of self-control, a life of discipline. In 1 of Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, let me read it to you. Don't you realize that in the race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. 
No, notice, notice Paul's illustration uh, of athletic contests, you know, about the athletic arena. And by, and by the way, it was very familiar to the Christians in Corinth. Paul writes to the Corinthians. Corinth was a city in Greece. Greece was known for its great athletic events. As a matter of fact, uh, the Olympics game started in Greece. We still have them today. And they had what was called the Isthmian Games, which were held at the city of Corinth every two years. Olympics every four, like we do now, and every two years they had these Isthmian Games. And every participant in those games had to take an oath. And that oath was that they had been training for 10 months, getting ready for this competition. And if they were not, they would be immediately disqualified. You had to prove, I'm ready, I'm training. So Paul, as he talks about the athletic arena, he mentions five qualities that he himself practiced that were part of his self-control routine, what he believed about discipline and self-control, and I think they will help us. So if you have your notes, here's number one. A self-controlled life has positive goals. Look at what he says in verse 24. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. Now, I want you to notice what the command here, it's to run. It's not to walk, not to stop, it's not to sit down, it's not to coast, it's not to just be a spectator. Paul says only those who keep the goal in mind will have any chance of winning. When you run a race, an athlete runs to win. You know what, not just to mess around, not just to goof off. You know, unfortunately, discipline is what we need the most, and self-control is what we need in our modern world but what we want the least. It's what we struggle with the most. It takes self-control and discipline to be a disciple because spiritual growth and being all that God wants you to be doesn't happen automatically. It has to be intentional. You have a part. You have something to do to be all that God wants you to be. And that's why a winner, you know, winners and athletes, they, you know, they're not half-hearted in their effort. They give it their all. And the reason most of us do not exercise self-control is discipline. It's very simple. You know what it is? We don't have any goals. In other words, why should I discipline myself? Why should I have self-control if I have no goals, if there's no purpose? You know, I find that all of us want to, to live financially stress-free, but we have no plan. We have no goals. We have no way to reach our financial goals. You know what? All of us want to be healthy, but we have no goals regarding our health. You know what? So we fail to discipline ourselves. We, want all, we all want great marriages, but we have no, no goals for our marriage to make it great. I want to be a spirit-led Christian. I want to be a great spiritual Christian. I want to be mature. But we have no specific spiritual goals. And because of that, we have no reason to discipline ourselves. We have no reason to, be, to practice self-control. And people that do have goals, you know, but are not disciplined and have no self-control, their goals are only pie-in-the-sky dreams because if you never have self-control or self-discipline, they're never going to become a reality. You know, for the athlete to win the prize, you know, for those that run in the athletic arena, there will be times when he will have to say no to himself and other times he'd have to say, you know what, yes to what he doesn't want to do. You know, get up and practice, get up and run. So I want to ask you, what are your goals? Do you have spiritual goals for your life? Do you have marital goals? Do you have financial goals? Do you have goals for your career, for your business? As a matter of fact, in your note, I put three little lines because I want you to think about what are your goals? Because honestly, if you have no goals, there's no reason to discipline yourself. There's no reason for self-control. You know, if you got nothing to shoot for, there's nothing to work for. Can I hear a good amen? So what you have is you have a lot of people just coasting, just existing, not living. Now listen, Paul says, you know what, you have to have goals because without goals, there's no self-control. A self-control life has positive goals. Listen, if you know where you're heading, it'll be easier to exercise self-control and discipline. You know, you'll know what you have to do. So get some goals. Think about it. Write them down and start, you know, you say, well, pastor, I don't have any. Well, it's time to get some. The second thing Paul learned about self-control and discipline, he's that a self-control life involves discipline. And as a result, there's a price to pay. Look at what he says in verse 25. All athletes are disciplined in their training, and they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. You know, once the athlete knows, Paul says, the prize he, he wants to win, he begins to train, and he begins to prepare himself for the day of competition. You see, discipline means to train. Self-control means you train yourself. And athletes train their bodies to compete. Now, I know... 
sometimes we think of discipline as punishment, and discipline is not punishment. Even though, although discipline sometimes seems like punishment, because sometimes it hurts. Amen? Sometimes it's hard. You know, why am I punishing myself? No, you're disciplining yourself. You know, in the original Greek, it says that every man that strives for mastery. In other words, some of your Bible says everyone who competes. And the actual word in the Greek is the word compete. It's a, it's a Greek word, agonazami. Or, uh, it's the word where we get our word agony. And the word agony carries this idea of struggling or contending with the enemy. You know, he, he talks about strict training. And it means to exercise restraint or abstinence. And, and a trainer, an athlete, had to stay away from certain foods, and he had to stay away from alcohol. So, you know, we, we not only need to say yes to certain things, but we also have to say no to those things that will knock us out of the race, those things that will get us off track. You know, anything that's going to get you out of track of your goals, you need to say no to them. Well, they're not a sin. It's not a matter of they're a sin. It's a matter of they're going to keep you from reaching your goals, and you have to discipline yourself. And I like what he says. He says, because you know these guys, they discipline themselves. They stay away from stuff. They, they work hard. They, they're committed. They're, they're focused. He says, and they, all, they do it all for a crown of a, a wreath, of sh- a shrubbery, of, you know, uh, it's, 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 and it's going to wither in a week. But our spiritual crown will never fade away. It will go with us into eternity. Do you know that when you discipline yourself and you have self-control, you benefit now, but it carries with you into eternity? So listen, your goals, whatever they are, you should have financial goals. You know, begin to plan, discipline yourself. For example, if you don't have financial goals, you're never going to get, you know, I know a lot of people that make a lot of good money, but they never have enough. You know why? They have no goals. They have no discipline in their finances. Listen, if you want to grow in your finances, you need to have goals. You need to have a plan. And part of the plan should include, you know, include, you know, having knowledge about money, how money works. You know what? I'll just include making connection with people who can help you. Financial planners, people who, who you respect, people who can give you wise advice. Our plan of discipline should include decisions that require self-control. Do you know that all of us have, the, in America, if you have a, a, a medium job, you have the potential to, to become very rich. You've got to discipline yourself. You've got to have a plan. You know, every choice we make to spend or not to spend money determines how quickly we're going to reach our financial goals. The same is true with your spiritual goals, with your marital goals, with your business goals. Do you have a plan of discipline, of self-control to reach your goals? Because a self-controlled life involves discipline. It takes discipline to be a disciple because spiritual growth and being all that God wants you to be isn't automatic. It's intentional. You have a role and a part to play in it. But here's what happens. Lord, I want you to do it. Holy Spirit, you do it. And what we've learned is that the Holy Spirit does do it, but he partners with us. No, I want him to do it all. He's not going to do it all. You have a part to play. You have to have skin in the game. Amen? You have to have a horse in the race, and that is you. Otherwise, you're not going to appreciate what God does. How many, of you, how many of you know people that God has done some amazing things and they don't appreciate it? The third thing that Paul says about a, a life of self-control, a self-controlled life demands focus. You've got to be focused. Okay, look at what he says in verse 25. Let me read that again, 26. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step, and I'm not just shadow boxing. Notice what he says. In other words, our lives should be lived with purpose and direction. Just like the athlete, he keeps his focus on the prize for winning the competition. Paul says, you know what, I'm focused on my heavenly goal of eternal life. And when you have goals and you have self-control, it becomes easy to make decisions. When you have goals, you know, you know when to say no to and what to say yes. An athlete has little trouble saying no to things that will not help him move closer to his goals. So-called opportunities do come around, but they say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I have, I have, I have health goals. You know, I, I want my sugar to go down. I want, I want to be healthy. I tell the Lord, Lord, I want a little long time. God says, then take care of yourself. I say, okay, Lord, help me take care of myself. But it's hard when people come to the office and bring their upside-down pineapple cake and give a piece to Pastor Vic. I say, you lying devil, I'm not going to eat you today, but I'm going to eat you tomorrow, amen, or half the day and half tomorrow. <laughs> but, 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 you know, there's a lot of opportunities that are not necessarily sinful or wrong, but they're not going to help you f- stay focused, not going to help you keep you on your goals. 
And the reason we have such little self-control when it comes to eating is, is that we lose sight of our goals, which is to be healthy. And what we focus on is on the instant gratification for the moment. You know, I have two problems when I get home. There are two sins that I commit when I get home. You want to know what they are? I'll be honest with you. Watch TV and eat while I watch TV. If I'm watching TV, I've got to be snacking. Amen. And snacking on the wrong stuff. Amen. I wish I could tell you I snack on vegetables, but no, I snack on chips, I snack on cookies, and, and, and that's not good for me. So one of the things that I'm learning as I'm achieving my goals, you better go to bed early, because if you stay up late, you're going to be snacky, all right? But we focus on that. Doesn't it feel good at night to be watching TV and snacking, even though you know it's bad for you? I, am I the only one? Am I the only one that gets sidetracked at night? No, Paul says, listen, you got to be focused. Now, Paul, in the middle, he didn't switch us from the metaphor of running in the race to wrestling or the boxing ring. In other words, the sport of boxing or wrestling was combined. It was more like the UFC Ultimate Fighting Championship. They were cage matches. And the boxers would wear gloves, and the gloves were filled with lead and iron, like brass knuckles. I mean, it was serious. I mean, you, if you were involved in that, you, you didn't probably come out alive. Or if you did come out alive, you were pretty beat up. And, and, and what Paul is saying is that I'm not shadow, but I'm not just acting like I'm, you know, boxing against shadow. No, this is real. Life is serious. You know, things are going on, and I need to stay focused. And listen, so do you. This is serious stuff. Amen. Your marriage is serious. Your spiritual life is serious. Your family, everything about you is serious. But sometimes we lose our focus because it's no big deal. Listen, it takes discipline. To be a disciple. It takes off control because with, without it, it's, you know what? Spiritual growth is not automatic. It takes intentional commitment on your part. Here's number four that Paul says. A self-controlled life includes the whole person, mind, body, and emotions. Look at what he says in verse 27. I discipline my body, all my body, like an athlete, training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. You know, Paul, Paul understood something that I want you to understand. Self-control begins in the mind. You know, do you know that we create what are called mindsets? Mindsets are ways of thinking. We determine in our minds that something is true or false based, based upon the, our way of thinking. Our mindset, our way of thinking really impacts us. It affects how we feel, and then how we feel determines how we act. And behave, and how we behave determines our destiny, what our life looks like. And, and Paul says that there are days when the athlete's body, athletic, the athlete's body is tired and sore, but he doesn't give up, he continues training. You know, there are days when he doesn't feel like training, but he does it anyway. There are days when he begins to doubt his ability to outperform, you know, what the competitors. But he keeps on training. There are days when he wakes up because why am I doing this? You know, I'm not even going to win. I'm not the best out there. You know, why, why continue? But he continues. Sometimes, you know what, life throws so many curves at us that we say, why try? You know what, I, I'm losing. I'm never going to win. I'm never going to get ahead. I'm never going to become all that God wants me to be. And you know, that type of, the, of mindset, that type of thinking sabotages you. You know what, it robs you. It discourages you. Sometimes we are our greatest enemy, you know, and that's why your mindset, your way of thinking is very important. Sometimes we have to, you know, Paul says, you know, renew our minds. Sometimes we need a renewal. We need, a, we need to be brainwashed by the word of God. That's the idea. Let God's word get inside of us. You know, Paul says, you know, in this verse, Paul says, you know, he disciplines his body. Instead of him being a slave to his body, he makes his body a slave to him. In other words, Paul says, listen, I'm not going to let my appetites, the appetites of my body, ruin my ministry. I'm not going to let that after serving the Lord and preaching that I be disqualified because I, I, I have no self-control. I have no discipline. So in the original Greek, what Paul says, I beat my body. It's the word buffet, not buffet, all right? Because when you read the word buffet, 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 you think of, you know what? You think of coconut shrimp, teriyaki chicken, and all those big old table of desserts. That's not what Paul is talking about. When he talks about buffet, he talks about beating. Literally, it's a word that means I hit, it, I hit under the eye until it's black and blue. In other words, Paul was very disciplined and very self-controlled. I don't want my body controlling me. And listen, you know what that means? Either your body is a slave to you or you are a slave to your body. 
Are you letting your passions or are your passions leading you? Do you who, are you in charge? Do you let your body tell your mind what to do? Or does your mind tell your body what to do? You know that most people today are slaves to their body. You know, that's why, you know, that's why they gain weight. Because they don't, ex- you know what, they don't, you know, they convince themselves I don't have to exercise. My body's going to tell me what, to- I eat whatever I want, whenever I want, and who cares? That's their mindset. A lot of people get in trouble with the opposite sex because they let their hom- hormones do the talking instead of them taking control of their hormones. Here's the idea. Paul says, without discipline, without self-control, we're not gonna, you're not going to get anywhere in life. If we're not disciplined enough, you know what, to set, a t- set time aside for God, you're not going to grow. If you are not disciplined spiritually, you're going to live an empty faith, an empty life, an empty spiritual life, void of any power, because you're not disciplined. You're not disciplined to spend time with God, to read to pray, to study, go to church, to serve. You know, you're not disciplined. We have to discipline ourselves. You know, these are our goals. And Paul says, listen, I I don't let my body tell me no. You know what? I tell my body what it's going to do. Paul says he exercised self-control. He was disciplined enough to stay away from all that would negatively affect his performance. Paul didn't want to end up wrong. One of the things that I have learned, I've been a Christian for all of these years, 50 years, a pastor for 40, uh, 40 something years. And you know what I've noticed? A lot of people start right, but they end terribly. A lot of people start very, very good, but you see them now, and they're not even serving the Lord. As a matter of fact, not only are they not serving the Lord, they make fun of Christians. They mock it. It's a waste of time. I believed it. I don't believe it anymore. It's nonsense. It's foolishness. And you know what? That saddens in my heart. And you know why that happens? Because they never learn self-discipline. They never learn to control, self-control. You know, I, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Viktor Frankl. He was a, a Jewish psychologist. And uh, during my years studying psychology, we read a lot of Viktor Frankl. And, and he, was a, he, he lived during the, the Holocaust. And he spent time in a na- Nazi concentration camp there in Germany. And he wrote, and he wrote these words. He said, they stripped me naked. They took everything, my wedding ring, my watch. I stood there naked and all of a sudden realized at that moment that although they could take everything away from me, my wife, my family, they killed his wife, my possessions, they could not take away my freedom to choose how I was going to respond. And he goes on and he talks about what kept him alive was his mindset, his way of thinking. He refused to allow negativity to fill his heart. He refused to give up. And in those horrible conditions of the concentration camp with no hope for the future, Viktor Frankl exercised self-control. He controlled his thinking, his body, his emotions. He stayed focused. He had purpose. He had a reason. He had goals. So I want to ask you, are you training your whole body? Does your mindset or ways of thinking need to be transformed? Do you got stinky thinking? Well, talk to God about it. Because I'm telling you, it takes discipline to be a disciple because spiritual growth is not automatic. It's, in, it's intentional. You have to know where you're going and what you want to accomplish. And here's the last thing that Paul learned. A self-controlled life means total submission to the coach and the coach's training plan. You know, our verse for this series has been Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You know, and, and, and he writes these words. He says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Notice. The only way you and I can live a life of self-control is to be totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit and His control. Even though we call it self-control, it's not self-help. It's not us doing it. It's the Holy Spirit doing us, doing it. But us allowing, us surrendering. You know, we can't control ourselves. The Holy Spirit is our coach. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to teach, to train, to correct, to encourage us. And when we yield to His coaching... We begin to experience a life of discipline and self-control. You know, self-control, biblically speaking, means walking in the Spirit. It means you're under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It means that you are committed, totally surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the Bible speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, these, these nine things that we've been looking at, it's not the result of your work. It's a result of you being connected, you being plugged in to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in your life doing all these things in you. They're the result of the Holy Spirit in and through us. I pray that that would be your desire, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because the truth of the matter, this fruit that we've talked about cannot become evident on your own. It's the work of God. 
as we yield, as we allow it, as we open our hearts and say, Lord, here I am. So let me just give you a couple ideas. How, how do I start? The starters of self-control. Let me give you a couple ideas. What do I do, Pastor Victor, from now on? Number one, start with yourself. Start with you. You know, someone once said, looking back, you know, looking back, my, my life seems to be one long, one long obstacle course with me, the chief obstacle. Amen. You know, some of you, as you're hearing this, you're thinking, man, I know someone that can really use this message. You know what? I, I know someone that can really benefit my brother, my sister, my husband, my wife, my neighbor, my dad, my mom, my kids, you know, somebody else. But no, God's speaking to you. Start with you. Forget everybody else. There's a sign that says, I remember reading a sign that says, if you could kick the person responsible for most of your troubles, you wouldn't be able to sit down for weeks. Amen. <laughs> the whole issue of self-control starts with self, starts with you. Stop trying to think who this applies. It applies to you, to me. Here's number two, start early. You know, if there's one thing that I, could tell, I would tell young people, I would say, if you learn self-control and self-discipline early, it's amazing the dividends it will pay later on in life. I was a teacher, a public school teacher of history for many years. And I taught history. And kids, that's the worst subject for a lot of kids. And they would come and say, Mr. Reese, we hate history. And I tried to make it as exciting. And I thought I was pretty good. But I could, very few of them could I draw them in. So one day I'm having a conversation with them. And I said, well, listen, you know, I know it's hard. I know there are some top, but, but what are you going to do when you have to go get a job? And they all said, we're going to get an easy job. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get an easy one. How many of you know of easy jobs? I don't. I don't. Here's the third thing, start small. So number one, start with yourself, start early. Number three, start small. What you're going to be tomorrow, you are becoming today. Today, you start developing self-discipline in small ways. You know what, today. And as you start in small ways, that will grow and there will be bigger ways. You know, how do you deal with the difficult problems of life? You deal with the small ones in the right way. And when the difficult ones come, you'll know how to deal with them. So how do you become a spiritual giant? Well, you start small. You don't start off big. You know, that's the mistake of life. Well, Pastor, I'm going to get my spiritual life right. I'm going to start praying for two hours. No, don't pray for two hours. Pray for one minute. Then go to two. Then go to three. Well, Pastor, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to join the gym. I'm going to buy equipment. I'm going to go to Jenny Craig's to get the right food. You know what? You're going to spend a lot of money, and two, three weeks later, you're going to throw it out because you tried to do too much. Start small. Can I hear a good amen to that? So how, how, do, you build a, how do you build a great marriage? You know what? Because marriages are hard to keep together today. You do it with the small things, and you do them well. You pay the price. You sacrifice. Small. Don't try to do everything all at once. Here's number four. Do the important things first. In other words, look at the things that you need to get control over. And I'm assuming that all of us have areas that we need to get control over, that we need discipline and self-control in. Amen? But how many of you probably need discipline in, the, in at least one area of your life where you don't exercise it right now? You can't tackle them all or knock them all out in one day. So in your notes, I put this. I put right there. I want you to write down. You know what? What, what do I need to focus on? What are three of my areas of weaknesses that I really, really need to focus on? Now listen, if you're here and you say, I'm not sure, just ask your spouse, guys, or, or wives. Ask the, ask the, they'll, they'll help you out. Write them down. What are three areas? And then after you write them down, of those areas that are weak, which one hurts you the most? In other words... Which one's defeating you the most? Which is the one that's keeping you from living the life that God wants you to live or you want to live? And, and once you decide what it is, begin to work on that area on a daily basis, one step at a time. Now, I would encourage you, if you're serious, have somebody hold you accountable. I am of the opinion that all of us should have people that we can say, you know what, I struggle with. People you can trust. People that are not going to blab it to everybody because we got blabbers all over the place. Amen. But someone that you can talk to and say, you know what, brother, sister, I'm working on this. And you know what, this is what it is. Hold me. This is what I've committed to. I'm going to work on it. And hold me. every time you see me, ask me, how are you doing in that area? Ask me. And I'll be honest with you. And you are honest with them. You know, and, and, and start moving and getting that area right. Straighten that area right. And then number five is you start now. Start now. Not tomorrow. All worthwhile men have good thoughts, good ideas, and good intentions. But precious few of them ever translate those into actions. Someone once said that the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Everybody has good intentions. But listen, I'm not telling you to leave here with good intentions. I'm asking you, leave here, and I'm going to start today. I encourage you that the best time to get self-control of your life is today, not tomorrow. You know, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Tomorrow's never going to come. 
Your dreams are never going to come to pass. You're never going to accomplish your goals if, if you put it off because we're all procrastinators. Do it right now. Start now. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Listen, self-control, very important. Discipline, important. And one of the things the Holy Spirit wants to produce in your life, it help you, is get yourself under control. Get a hold of yourself with his help. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want to pray with you. Father God, thank you, Lord, that uh, this, these qualities, these virtues called the fruit of the Spirit is not something we have to do on our own. Thank you, Lord, that you're willing to help us. They are the result of staying connected with you. And Father, what a, what a wonderful thing it is to see ourselves being transformed, changed, Lord, from areas that were out of control that now they're under your control. So Father, we confess to you we have some of those areas. We need your help. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move. I pray that you would touch and you would minister. And Father, I pray for those that are here today and don't know Christ. Father, they don't have the power. They, have, they don't have the ability and probably don't have the clue of how all this happens because it starts with you. They need you. So Father, I pray that you would draw their hearts to you. I pray that those that don't know Christ, today that there would be a tugging in their hearts. There would be an awareness. I'm lost. I need Jesus. I'm a sinner. I need to be born again. I need to be saved. I need a new life. And Father, we know that that's only accomplished through Jesus Christ. So draw their hearts to you. And Father, today I commit to you your church, our church family. I commit your people, those that are here, those that are online. Lord, I, I believe there are people here, God, that that, Lord, have a desire but have no clue on how to proceed. I pray that today they would have gotten some ideas. And it starts with turning it over to you. So, Father, I commit them to you. I ask your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, my desire is that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord would make his face shine upon you. The Lord would pour out his peace, his love, and his blessing. That you would exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in every aspect of your life. And if you are not, then you would ask God for help. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. Go in peace. See you Wednesday at 7.15 in person or online. God bless you. We love you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Who God bless. Who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me?